Matthew chapter 9, 35 to 38. There are some Bibles available um, if you would uh, like to look at them. I think it's great that we're in Matthew's Gospel still. Um, next week, we're going to kind of deviate a little bit to uh, Christmas and thinking about the Christmas story, thinking about Jesus, kind of w- what it really means at Christmas time for us. And obviously, with Advent, we're not only remembering Jesus coming for the first time, but we're looking forward to his return, longingly awaiting his return, where actually all the wrongs will be made right. And, and this morning's passage, uh, we're told when we uh, read the whole Bible story that actually Jesus will return one day, and we don't know exactly when that will be, but we know that the nations will have heard about Jesus. That tri- every tribe, tongue, and nation, there will be representatives from all of them who will be calling upon the name of the Lord. And so there's an emphasis all through the New Testament on actually getting this message out. And that's what we see here in Matthew chapter 9. So it fits quite well with kind of thinking about Advent, thinking about all that is to come, and of course, the return of Jesus. And uh, in chapter 9, for those that have been coming regularly, but for those that haven't, just by way of recap, the theme has been faith. The theme has been stretching out in faith, seeing your faith built. There's been a number of miracles that have taken place, which would build your faith if you saw it happen. The dead have been raised. Uh, A woman who's been bleeding for a long time has been miraculously healed, and she stretched out in faith towards Jesus. But the little girl who was dead did nothing. Jesus went to her. Then you have two blind men who can't see yet follow Jesus, and then they're miraculously healed as well. There's a demonic man. Who, uh, and, the, and there's demons and the, there's all those kind of things that Jesus cast out as well. And um, basically the call has been, here's Jesus Christ, have faith. Have faith in me that actually the impossible can be made possible. Miracles happen, lives are transformed, and the call is to be a church full of faith in Jesus. That actually no matter what our circumstances, no matter what we're looking at in life, that actually God goes with us. And I I feel like this is why it's here at the end of Matthew 9. But the question that I've always got when I see Jesus do miracles and we talk about stretching out in faith and building faith is what on a practical level does that look like? Does that make sense? Like It's one thing saying let's stretch out in faith, but how do I stretch out in faith? What is it to actually do that on a day-to-day basis as I navigate the ups and downs of life? What does it mean for me to actually practically step out in faith and demonstrate faith in Christ in my world, with the people that I'm meeting, with my work colleagues, with my friends, with my family? And I love it when you have a question like that and then the Lord goes, well, here's your answer, just open up the Bible. And shows you a piece of scripture. Happens time and again. And we'll get to it um, in verses 35 to 38. But also chapter 10, which will be in in the new year, partly answers it. But also James does in the New Testament. In James chapter 2 when he talks about faith. And he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has a faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, some people think that James is kind of contrasting with what Paul says, but he's not. And he's not saying here that our works save us. But what he is saying is, if we have a faith in Jesus Christ alone to be saved, then our life should look different as a result. Works should flow from us having faith in Jesus. There should be good things that come from it. If if there's somebody without clothes, they should be clothed because we've got our faith in Jesus. God's been gracious to us, so we show grace with others. It flows into our character. And I think that's what's spelled out for us here in Matthew is, okay, if we've got a faith on a practical level, what are a couple of the marks of the kingdom, if you like, of people that are full of faith? And I think 35 to 38 answer that. 
I'm kind of looking at this in quite a different way to how we traditionally read it, but you'll have to go with me. Matthew 9, 35 to 38 says this. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So I've just got a few thoughts, I think three or four, um, on um, what it actually looks like to kind of stretch out in faith, what it looks like to build faith, what we see here in Matthew 9. Because when these Gospels are put together, they're not always chronological, but they're done with a purpose. You know, Matthew's put this here on purpose. It's not an accident. It's not just gone, oh, well, I'll, I'll shove this here as a, as it's a good conclusion. But it's, it's written and put there to tell us something. So verse 35, which is following on from all these miracles that Jesus has been doing. And we read further that he's been going around every affliction, every illness, he's been healing them. He's been going from place to place, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. And there's this pattern that emerges from the Gospels and the New Testament in particular, is that where the good news is preached, signs and wonders follow. You see that in Acts in particular, that where the, the apostles are there sharing the good news of Jesus, signs and wonders follow. It's as if um, the word of faith is spoken out and it changes the atmosphere. That where light comes into darkness, not only is it metaphorical, but it really does make a difference. It, it really does change people's lives. And the good news is one of that we were dead and then God gave us life or that we're broken and we get restored. And the first thing we see here to do in faith, I believe, and, and this is a prayer, we've said this before, I think multiple times, but this is, I think, a prayer that God loves to answer. The first thing for those that want to stretch out in faith and build faith is start talking about your faith. I know that seems like really obvious, but sometimes we miss that step. It's to take the opportunities to actually start sharing. I know it's been said that, you know, share your life, but your life includes opening your mouth. Your life includes communicating your story, communicating God's story, that we have a Father in heaven who loves us. How else will people hear if we don't speak, Paul says? And what you see here is Jesus, Jesus is going from place to place. From synagogue to synagogue, what's he doing when he gets there? He's teaching, he's preaching, he's sharing the good news. And what follows is, well, there's people that, are, people that are being healed as well, and that goes along with it because the kingdom is being proclaimed. A new way of living is being proclaimed. All too often sometimes, I'm, it's, it's not here, but in some parts of the church, you have an overemphasis on one or an overemphasis on the other. Well, actually, a beautiful thing would be that we're the people who share faith in God. We share God's story. And as we do that, we start seeing brokenness because we will come up again. And we start seeing restoration, that we take the opportunity to pray for people. It follows naturally on, doesn't it? We share the hope in Jesus. Let me pray for you that you'd be full of the Spirit. And when we start doing those things, when we start interacting, when light is pouring forth, it does change the atmosphere. It's what we see here is Jesus goes from place to place and says, and he's always on point. This is what I love with Jesus. He says he's sharing the message of the kingdom. He's not going off on tangents. All these parables and all these stories bring you back to the same story. Bring you back to this. I've come that you might know the Father. I've come that you might know me. I've come that you might have a relationship with a God who you were far off. And um, it's a great prayer to pray, isn't it? That the people that are in our world, the people that we're interacting with, that we pray, God, give me the opportunity today to speak to them. And I've shared this story before, but I want to share it with you because even when you go out of your way to not see anybody on a certain day, the Lord can still do miraculous things. I've said this before when I was um, 17, 18, 19, I was a bit grumpy um, and 
not the most reliable at turning up at college. Um, not necessarily your model kind of citizen. But I prayed. I remember praying after being at church on a Sunday. I remember praying on that Monday morning. Oh, God, I pray you give me the opportunity to speak to someone today, knowing full well I wasn't leaving the house. Knowing full well I'd have my pajamas on all day. Um, and what do you know? A Jehovah's Witness turns up at my door. Um, I think I got changed by then. I can't remember those details. But he came in. We had a little chat. He didn't come back. But actually, even though I didn't leave my house, I still had the opportunity to share faith with someone who was actually saying, oh, well, what do you believe then? Oh, okay, God, I get the picture. Maybe tomorrow I'll leave my door and see what happens. But it's a great prayer to pray. Maybe you pray certain things in the morning, you know, God, give me strength today. God, would you help me to do my best and at work and to represent you well? Maybe add a little line to that. God, give me the opportunity to speak of you today as well. I mean it and just see what happens. I, I really think like faith being stretched and wanting to build our faith, it's one of those, you've got to step out. We can't, as a church, say we, we want to be full of faith, we want to build faith, we want to stretch out in faith, and then not move towards God. We can't, because we'll just stay in the same place. We'll never move forward, we'll never see lives transformed. It's about actually stepping into the unknown, which is scary. Stepping out and saying, God, I've got to trust you in this. And actually sharing God's story, God's heart, that actually loves the people that we're speaking to. What a better message. What better thing have we got to bring, especially this Christmas time? I guarantee we have more opportunities over December than we have the rest of the year combined, I think. Just because people are like, oh, yeah, I'll come to a carol service. I'll, I'll, I'll come to a, a pantomime. I'll go for some festive drinks. People are up for it because of the season. Um, and so I think we should use that, really. Take advantage of that in our conversations and in, oh, we've got a carol service. Well, what happens at a carol service? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. I mean, if you invite them, they'll hear about him. But actually, it's better done in relationship, isn't it? It's one thing me or, or Carl or somebody else standing at the front and telling the story. It's another thing hearing it from their mate who they see day in, day out. See their life on display and then hear this story of, oh, well, that's why you live in such a way. That's why you have kingdom values. That's why you're gracious. That's why you're loving. And we don't always get it right, but we work towards that, don't we? And it does make a difference. There is that famous saying, which I mentioned already, which is let your life do the talking, which is brilliant, but which we do want it to, but often our words undo what we look, don't we? So we, we live in such a way, but often our words and the things that we say undo actually some of the things that we've been doing and the love that we've been showing. What if our words actually contributed and demonstrated why we live in such a way? And that sure applies to me and the things that I say and thinking uh, very carefully about saying things as it does to others with all of our relationships of thinking, God, I need your help in what to say and how to say it. My second observation is this, and it's the observation that Jesus makes, which I think is interesting. And I think he's describing the crowds, but I think he's describing me. I think he's describing you. I think he's describing all people in all time. When he looks upon the crowds that are there and he says, he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion's an, uh, an interesting word. And the way that I've kind of read that is it's almost like some, when something wrenches your gut. Do you know that feeling where you see something and it's just so wrong that some, somehow in here you sense injustice or you sense wrong and you're so wrenched about it that you just have to do something about it. Has anybody ever felt that? That they see something, you might be watching the news and you just see some disaster in some part of the world and it just does something to your inside, doesn't it? It causes something to happen in here. And, and that's what happens here. Where Jesus looks upon the crowds and it's, it's almost like a gut-wrenching feeling. They're harassed. They're helpless. They need something. They need someone. They're sheep without a shepherd. Sheep are chaotic, aren't they? They just go where they please, do what they want, run out in front of cars. I think farmers would say that they're not the most kind of switched on animal all the time compared to others 
And Jesus looks at the crowds and is like, it's just a bit chaotic. And actually, it's a description of us. For me, this time of year is a particular time where I feel harassed and helpless. Christmas shopping. Right? Like, Grace wants to go from store to store with no idea what we're buying. I just feel helpless. I feel harassed. The crowds. It's not a fun activity for me. I mean, I know some of you will enjoy that, and that's great. Bless you. But I love Amazon. I love that I can order it online. <laughs> this is getting back to I don't leave my house kind of thing again. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I feel, like, stressed being in crowds of people all vying for this one toy for Christmas or for having to go into this shop that I don't want to go into. I don't want to walk around Marks and Spencers. I don't want to go to this shop. I just want to go to the Lego store. I just want to go to the Apple store. Or go and sit and have a hot chocolate. That's my idea of Christmas shopping. If that's anybody else's, we'll sort something out. Whilst others can go and do all the things that I don't want to. But it just made me think that kind of feeling of actually feeling a bit stressed with life, a bit harassed and, and helpless and out of our depth is what Jesus looks at when he sees us and goes, oh, we've got to do something about that. We've got to step in. And the thing is, sometimes we categorize, don't we? We see groups of people and we go, oh, they look helpless and harassed. And we assume that we're not. Whereas actually, we're all in that same boat. Jesus looks at the, all of the crowds with all their stories and all their backgrounds and all their different baggage and nuances, everything that they bring to the table. And he has compassion on them all. His gut wrenches for all of them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And the other, the other side of that is, one, our lives are a bit chaotic, but two, Jesus says he's actually the good shepherd. We read about that in scripture, don't we? That he's the shepherd who comes for his sheep and he actually lays down his life for his sheep. But shepherds are rock hard. I don't know if you thought about that. When I think of shepherds, I always think of a little bit of a crook and a tea towel. Right? From the nativity, oh, there's the shepherds. They're nice, cuddling the sheep. It's all very cute. But actually, back in Jesus' day, when he's talking about shepherds, these are fighters. These are people that have got to fight off the bear and the wolf to protect their flock. Guys that have got to work long hours in tough conditions in order to protect those that have been entrusted to them. They're courageous. They're hardworking. They're strong. And Jesus says, I am that shepherd who comes to protect the sheep, who comes to actually look after the sheep and take us in his arms. And there's this great prophecy from Micah, Micah 5.4, and it says, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. When I'm feeling harassed and helpless, secure is the last thing I'm feeling, right? Might feel alone, might feel a bit beaten up, might feel low. I don't feel secure. What Jesus says here is, I'm coming, I'm having compassion on you that you would feel secure. That actually you know it is well. That it's going to be okay. That I'm with you from now to the end of the age. And Jesus stands in that gap for us. Doesn't that's what the cross is? It's the gap between us and God. And he comes and he stands in the gap that we might be secure with God forever. That's good news, right? And actually, for all the things that we see and wrench our gut, this is what the people, this is one way we stretch out in faith is we go in the strength of the Lord. And like Jesus who had compassion, we, the people of God, full of the Holy Spirit, are to have compassion to bring security. How do we bring security? By introducing them to Jesus. Because I can't hold people. I can't cause people to feel secure with God. Only God can do that. Only God can do that to my heart. But we're to stand in the strength of the Lord that where there is injustice, 
We need to be bringing justice. We need to be bringing the love of God into those situations. We need to stand in the strength of the Lord against hatred, against discrimination. We need to be those people as Christians on the front line, full of compassion, a gut-wrenching compassion that means we don't just walk on by or leave people as they are, but we love them and we lavish the love of God on them. But in that, we have to quickly realize um, that we're doing that not in our own strength, but we do that in the strength of the Lord. So we go and do that in our own strength, we end up with a bit of a saviour's complex. We think we're the hero, that somehow life can't carry on without us. Whereas actually, if we're there standing in the gap representing Christ, we're saying, look, you want to dwell secure? You want to know what real love is? Then I love you, but more than that, God loves you. Stretching out in faith means actually going to the last, the least, the lost, the broken. But it also means going to those that maybe in the eyes of the world wouldn't perceive that they're the last, the least, the lost, the broken. Jesus looked at the whole crowd and had compassion upon the whole crowd. The rich, the poor, the young, the old. Every walk of life were to show compassion and go in the strength of the Lord. Jesus looked upon the crowd and their helplessness and their harassment was through a lack of knowing Jesus. That was the cause of it, which is why he had compassion. Do you know anybody who doesn't know Jesus? Do you? Yeah, me too. We're to go with that message in compassion, in a compassionate way, in a gut-wrenching way, in a way that just lavishes love upon those people. And when we do that, you don't go alone, but full of the strength of the Lord, full of God, the Holy Spirit. And I, I just want to draw on this final bit here of what faith in action looks like. I think it's sharing our faith, but I also think it's being full of compassion with all people, those that know Jesus and those that don't know him. But it was the cause of the harassment and the helplessness that Jesus was perceiving was due to a lack of relationship with him. It wasn't material wealth or lack of material wealth. It was a lack of spiritual wealth, if you like. That's the fundamental need that Jesus sees in the people. And then you get this bit here at the end. He says to his disciples now, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Firstly, I just want to just draw on the imagery that Jesus uses. He's always quite particular. But here the imagery he's using is of harvest and crops and stuff growing. And I don't know if you've ever, I mean, I know there's a few people that have got an allotment here and people that enjoy growing vegetables. I did try it. But it was, it was in the winter that it rained. And it rained so much, my potatoes drowned. I didn't know that was possible. Apparently it is. But for those that grow vegetables, for those that have ever tried to grow vegetables, you know that there's kind of a process, isn't there? And Jesus here, he doesn't say there's a process, but he says there's a harvest. So he's using that kind of language. So we actually go, well, what do you mean, Jesus? Um, it's not a case of all of a sudden, you know, you turn up at your allotment, you go away after zero work, and the next day your veg is there. That doesn't happen, does it? it? It doesn't happen like that. There is a process. And I think there's a bit of a process here. It just got me thinking about, well, what does it mean for us to kind of show faith and to stretch out in faith? It's all well and good saying, you know, share the good news of Jesus and go in compassion. But is there a kind of, if there's something in what Jesus is saying here, And it got me thinking, well, actually, when you go, say you had a a piece of land, the first job is to clear the land, isn't it? The first job is to actually get in there and go, right, okay, well, we need to clear whatever is unhelpful here. It got me thinking, well, some people have got obstacles to faith, haven't they? Some people have got such big hang-ups that actually you can't even get onto the conversation about faith in Jesus because there's something else blocking the way first. Sometimes we've got to clear the ground with people. Sometimes we've got to put in the hard yards over a long time and investing with people and clearing away the obstacles that people have. And it might be, sometimes we don't have the answer. And you know what? It's really good to say, I don't know. 
but then to go home, Google it, and come back with the answer the next day. That's okay. That's a good thing to do. It's better than making up something that's wrong, isn't it? To say, you know what, honestly, I don't know. I've not thought about that, but let me go and have a look at it. Let me find out for you. Let me see if somebody else knows. You know, ask Carl, he'll know. Don't ask me. <laughs> or ask Jim. Jim will know, won't you? Yeah, see, guaranteed. 100% accuracy with Jim McGlade. Thank you very much. Um, but the first thing you do is you, you do the groundwork. Then you go and you prepare the soil, I think, from what I can remember. And then after you've prepared the soil and you've got everything ready, you then sow the seed. And then, once you've sown the seed, you tend it, don't you? You might protect it from the evil slug. Or you might put in measures to make sure that whatever you're growing has every chance of coming through. Now, you don't see it for a while, do you? And it can be a bit disheartening. Certainly with my potato experience, I was wondering, what is going on? Only to dig them up and realize there were more water than anything else. On that occasion, I've not done it since. But you have to, there's a process, and it's all going on under the surface. And then, one day, life. Might start small, but then it grows, doesn't it? And then there's the harvest. And Jesus says here, I don't know if you've noticed the words that he says, he doesn't say the harvest is like my potatoes. He doesn't say that. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we need more people, in other words, what Jesus is saying, doing this stuff, the clearing the ground, removing the obstacles, removing the objections that people have towards faith. And you do that with time and love. We need more people sowing, sharing the good news of Jesus with people. You know, we've said this lots and lots of times, but sometimes when we have a conversation with someone, we think, oh, it's not going anywhere. Well, I always say, you don't know, actually, other Christians that that person might interact with and other ways that actually it might form one day. I hear stories time and again of how, oh, I had a conversation with a Christian 10 years ago and it said this and it set me on my journey. And though it didn't look like anything at the time, seeds were sown. Especially when we, we think of young people and children. Seeds are sown. Seeds can be sown even at a young age. That we might think, oh, it's not come to fruition. 30 years later, God does a beautiful thing in their life and they come to faith. So don't be disheartened. When you plant your seed under the soil, it looks like nothing is going on. But stuff is happening, isn't it? If you've prepared the ground, stuff happens under the surface even when we can't see it. And then there's a measure of tending it and protecting it. One year when I grew strawberries and I thought I've got them in a pot on the ground, I thought I'd done everything I needed to, I got about two strawberries or four plants. The slugs must have got oh, ten times that, I don't know. They got a lot of strawberries. I realized I need a hanging basket. But then I think you've got a bird problem, potentially. So I've just decided to not, I don't even like strawberries, so I don't know why I was growing them. I think it was more for the adventure and the fun of it. But you have to tend what you're growing. You have to protect it, don't you? You have to spend time. You don't just sow something and leave people. We don't just share the gospel with someone and then abandon them. We walk with them. We're there. We're reliable. We're trustworthy. In the ups and the downs, we walk with people. And that is tough. But it's worth it. And I think the greatest way that we can tend and protect is prayer. And that's kind of what Jesus is getting at here when he's saying, disciples, pray. Is that if we're witnessing to someone and, you know, they're going through the ups and downs of life, is to commit to pray regularly for them. To continue to uphold them in prayer, to not give up on people, but to pray, pray, and pray some more. And you know what? At the end, by God's grace, there can be life. For every single one of us here who's put our trust in Jesus, that life that's been brought about is the grace of God. That he's done a miracle in our life that actually has meant we connect with him, that we've put our trust in him. And actually, that for, for people, Jesus is saying here, the world is ripe. 
there are hundreds of thousands of people that are just waiting. Sometimes we feel like actually nobody wants to hear the message of Jesus. And sometimes we'll share and people will go, shut up. Or probably ruder words than that. But sometimes they'll respond and go, you know what, actually, yeah, I'd be really interested. I'd really like to know more. Oh, have a bite. Oh, yeah. And they'll just hoover it up. We will see life when we step out in faith because we serve a gracious God. Not because we're necessarily super skilled and we're brilliant at the whole cultivating thing. It's less about us and more about him. Our responsibility is being people that step out in faith. You know, when we step out in faith, we're saying, God, please do your thing. (laughs) Please do your thing. Give me the words to say. Help me to clear the ground. Help me to tend. Help me to commit. Help me to pray. So that we see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. It's his way of saying there are people waiting, just waiting to hear this good news of Jesus. So my takeaway from that is don't have a small vision of God. Don't have a small vision of how God can use you. Sometimes we do that. We might have a big vision of God, but we think that big vision of God doesn't impact us. But actually have a big vision of how God can use you in the spheres that you're in with the people that you're rubbing shoulders with, that they're people that you can have an impact upon. Don't have low expectations of what God can do. He's amazing, isn't he? We've just seen in Matthew chapter 9, miracle, miracle, the dead being raised, no problem for God, healings. And, and, and then he says, pray and go. And do it. Stretch out in faith and show compassion on people. Don't have small expectations. We serve a big God. And you know, as a church, we can do fun stuff. I love fun stuff. That's great. Um, It's it's great to have um, lots of good things going on. Things like carol services and pantomimes and all that. But you know, the church doesn't exist for those things. We don't exist as a a body of people for those things. They're all great things that form a part of what it means to be part of a church family. But the church exists to tell people about Jesus. That's what we're here for. That's what it's about. We realize that, don't we? It's for him, through him, to him. All things belong to him. And that's what we need to do. And Jesus here, as the last point I'm just saying, calls us to pray. Sometimes we can fall into the trap of feeling like it can be a bit of a dead activity. Do you know what I mean when I say that? You know, you can read your Bible and go, I've amassed some information. I've furthered my knowledge of God. But prayer sometimes can feel like just, oh, hard. Oh, well, I won't pray today. I'll just crack straight on and get straight into something else. But it's not that at all. In fact, here, let me just read it to you again. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Okay, so there's your problem. What's the answer? Pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest field. Pray earnestly. It's a kingdom activity. So before action... Before all those things I've spoken about, because I didn't say that these were necessarily in chronological order of things to stretch out in faith for. Stretching out in faith and building faith exercises to pray and to pray more and to pray hard. It's to invest into our prayer life because it's us talking and communicating with our Father. And you know what as well, you know what I love about this passage is um, we're told to pray, but we can also be the answer to those very prayers. I like it when that happens. It's like, pray for the laborers to be sent out into the harvest field. Okay. Who are the laborers? Oh, yeah, that might be me. It's praying, actually, yes, that God would do that. But also, don't say, God, I pray you'd do an amazing work in this person, and you'd use this person, and you'd use this person, and you'd raise up an army of people, and I'll wave at them from the side. (laughs) That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, pray earnestly. And actually, pray God would use you. 
Because within this room, there are an incredible amount of stories, an incredible amount of gifts, and every single one of us can do this. This is not an exclusive thing. This is for everybody because it's for the church. He says, disciples, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's you. Do these things. Contribute to the kingdom of God in your way and get on with it. Whatever that might be, whatever gifting you have, whatever passions God has birthed in with you, use those to the glory of God. Use those as opportunities. Whatever workplace you're in, use that place of work. Use the opportunities you have with the people that have been thrown into life with you. Your neighbors. All these different people. Be a part of what is God is doing. And I think that's what a faith that stretches out and is built up looks like. It's we take a chance. We step out. We're people full of prayer. And prayer is not a it's not just a second rate activity. It's part of our faith being built. So first thing to say is you want your faith to be stretched, start praying more. Start talking to God more. Start asking to be used by him more. He loves to answer those prayers. And then do it. Start having conversations. Start talking about your faith. Start clearing the ground. And do it all full of compassion. That's really important. Because the way that we approach people, people, people see that, don't they? You know, all the time, oh, well, not all the time. That's an exaggeration. But I've heard it said from time to time, Oh, you know, that person in the street was just preaching hellfire at me. Well, okay, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But it it leaves a lasting impression. But if we're people who share the good news of Jesus with compassion, full of grace, full of love, that can't be leveled at us, can it? That won't be leveled at us. And sometimes, yeah, there's hard things to say. But we want to be a people full of prayer, full of action, and full of the good news that transforms lives.